It's been about a week since .NET Conf finished up, which means that .NET 5 and C Sharp 9 are the new hotness available for everybody to use. I'm particularly interested in the new pattern matching. Let's mash on that. Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of the ASP.NET Monsters. In today's episode, I'm going to talk a little bit about pattern matching in C Sharp 9. Uh, now, pattern matching is not a new concept in C Sharp 9. It's been around uh, in various forms since C Sharp 7, but C Sharp 9, I think, is really where uh, it comes to its own. It's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, so I thought I would go over it and we can take a look and see how it works here. Uh, so I have put together a very simple application here that has a few variables and we print out a few console write lines here and there. Uh, so right now we have a number of records that come in and we print different things uh, based on the number of records that we have. Uh, so this is, should be a fairly common sort of construct that you would see inside of your application. Uh, so this looks like pretty standard code. It is a little bit verbose, but uh, that's kind of what we have in C Sharp. Uh, now pattern matching has come to make things a little bit easier. So let's take a look uh, first off at line number 16 here. So this is a, again, a pretty common sort of construct that you would see. So if my records is between 25 and 35, then do something. Uh, now, this has always bugged me because if I'm talking to somebody, I'm going to say something like, hey, if records is between 25 and 35, which in fact I just said. But if you look at the code, it says if records is greater than 25 and records is less than 35. Uh, so that feels kind of unnatural to me because I'm repeating records here. Like I know that I want this second clause to apply to the same thing as the first one, uh, but I just don't have any way of expressing that sensibly. Uh, but this is where pattern matching starts to come into its own again. So we can actually change this line here uh, to look like this. Uh, so we're gonna put and in here. I'm gonna hit escape here because I have an extension that is trying to change that to ampersands. Uh, code rush, which I'm sure will be soon be updated. Uh, so I can put this little pattern in here. So this is a way of applying patterns that is very terse and can be used inside of if statements. Uh, so it lets me really clean this up here. So you can see records is greater than 25 and less than 35. So this now seems like the sentence that I would use if I was talking about this, if I was trying to convey this information to somebody, now the code looks like this too. So that's really nice to be able to, to put that in place. Uh, so you can use this format inside of if statements. Uh, and in fact, you can even use it inside of link statements. So let's take a look at this complex object here that I have so a list of these complex objects here. So I can use the same sort of thing inside of a link statement and have something that looks like this, where I'm going to use a find and I'm going to use age is greater than 20 and less than 30 uh, dot first name to find that. Uh, and I can, of course, couple additional things in here too. So if I want to have a second thing that I'm matching on here, so I can do and uh, x dot sale dot category is category dot pants perhaps uh, uh, so we can continue on like that uh, and i'm using this here you could just use yeah an equals here and you'd have the same sort of result but uh we're going to try and maintain this whole like pattern matching theme here so you can use it like this. Uh, now you can also use pattern matches in, inside of switch state. So let's go up here and take a look at this block here that we've already identified being kind of a pain, super verbose. I mean, it is line 16 through 30, There's about 14 lines of code here. So let's see if we can make this a little bit more terse using some pattern matching here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do uh, console.write line, which is what I have 
kind of inconsistently here. We'll just assume that it's consistent. Uh, go back and make that consistent. There we go. Uh, and then I'm going to take a switch statement in here. So the way that this is going to look now is I'm going to do records. And then I can put a switch right here, uh, which is a nice syntax. And then I can just give this curly braces here. And then I'm going to kind of copy the same patterns up that I had before. So I don't even need to put records in here. I can just say if it's greater than 25 and less than 35. Oh, let's go to Rush. Trying to be smarter than me. Ah, stop it. Uh, greater than 20. Oh, I'm trying to put what to do here. I'm going to return this sentence here. So 20, I'm going to return u greater than 20 and less than 20. I'm going to return u less than 20. So there we go. I can replace all of those lines with just these about five lines here. Uh, so that makes it a lot cleaner. I think this is a lot more readable, uh, especially when you start to get like way more complicated things here. So if we had uh, a similar sort of switch statement, maybe down here using our complex object, then we might have multiple things that we want to switch on and being able to put them kind of all in the same switch statement uh, makes things really nice and clean. Uh, now, you might notice here that I'm getting a squiggly line here underneath my switch statement here. So, like, we didn't see any problems with this before when we were using the if statement. So this is a similar sort of construct. I don't get any warnings here. So let's take a look and see what the complaint here is on this one. A little bit difficult to read. Uh, but basically, it says a switch expression does not handle all possible values of its input type. It is not exhaustive. For example, the pattern 20 is not covered. Uh, so this is super handy because it is telling me that I have missed something here. So if I go and add the default case in here, then we can start being very explicit about the problems that we might encounter. So if I know for sure that this value is always going to be between 20 and say 35, then I can be confident just throwing this not implemented exception here because uh, this is going to cover every other case. Or I can go and be really explicit and say, well, you know, if it is less than or equal to 20, then we're going to return just an empty string. Uh, and I suspect this is still not exhaustive because I haven't covered greater than 35, I don't think. But, uh, oh, actually I have because this case here will cover that. So that covers everything there. So there we go. So now we have this really nice coverage here. If I went to comment at this line out here, I think it would complain again, I'm hoping, because I don't have anything covering greater than 35. No, it hasn't. So I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how well this works, but it is really nice to have this coverage in there to be able to do things like this. Uh, and a great place that you can use this for is using enum. So I have uh, a handy enum down here with shirts, pants, and socks. So let's go and write ourselves a quick switch statement here uh, on this uh, thing. So I'm just going to take the complex objects up first. First, I'm going to switch on that. And uh, I'm actually going to take the sale. Uh, what's this problem here? Do I not have link included? Oh, yeah. I just need to go and use system.link. So sale dot category here. So I've got this switch statement on that. And I'm just going to do like category dot pants. Category dot shirt K 
category that sucks. All right. So I thought that was everything here. So I still get this warning here. So this question is that handles some values, but it's input. It's not exhaustive. If we're not naming num value, for example, the button category three is not covered. So um, this is basically just saying that if there's an additional category, we aren't going to know what it is. So it's kind of encouraging me to handle scenarios that might come up in the future where we expand our list of categories here. So I can, again, just match on the default here. Oh, do not implement it. All right, so it's going to catch me and try and steer me away from creating these scenarios where problems are going to occur in the future. Um, I'm a little bit sad about the way this is implemented. I'd really like it to work like this without any exceptions. And then if I was to go and add an additional thing down here, then it would start throwing the exception about the missing switch. Um, so it, it does throw that complaint, but if I have this kind of like cover all case in there, uh, then it's not gonna catch that. So that could probably still use a little bit of work because that's a feature that I really like in F sharp is these exhaustive coverage. Um, so if you go and expand your category at some later date, uh, it's gonna highlight all the code throughout your application that might be a problem so that you can go back and add cases for each one of those in there. So it doesn't look like that quite works the same way here in C sharp. So perhaps that's like a, a C sharp 10 sort of thing that we can look forward to, or maybe I'm just doing things wrong here. Uh, but that's kind of the basics of pattern matching. The idea here is it's gonna clean up your code. It's gonna make these more complex statements a lot more readable, a lot easier to, to do. Um, and basically it's just gonna be generally better for everybody, I hope. Uh, so I'm going to start using these in any of the code that I can going forward, anything that's not stuck on sort of older framework versions. And I encourage you to do so too. So thanks everybody for joining us on today's episode. Remember to like, comment, and share, and we'll see everybody next week.